Hey Johannes, welcome to Airhex FM. Hi. Hi, nice to be here. <laughs> I'm really curious about the answers. I suspect something like uh, MBP 2018. What was your first computer? That's an interesting question. So, so I started getting late into computer science um, and into the whole computer game. Um, but my father was like, my father is like an electrical engineer. So my first computing device was a C control. Maybe the older folks remember these these predecessors of Arduinos, which was like a microcontroller that was really, really expensive and didn't have any power. So that was like the first computing device that I owned, but before I was like as a child uh, playing with a Windows uh, 98 computer. But my proper first machine was a small AMD machine that I got like when I was 14 or 15 years old, and then later, shortly, I moved to a netbook, like a two-core Intel Atom machine. I can tell you it's pretty cool when you're doing an OpenCV, when you're compiling an OpenCV-based project on a two-core Atom machine with two gigabytes of RAM. Ah, good old times. Yes, these were so, my first computing machines. Okay, so you remember the first contact on computer? So we, my, my my first contact with computers was because my father is an electrical en engineer and he liked his son to play with with things. So my first contact was doing some whole HTML stuff, like in grade five or so, in grade six. Um, wow! Even so, like, so you didn't start playing. So you did something with HTML. You started with yeah. HTML. So, the, so there was an HTML course in in Heidelberg. I, I come from like the cultural area, so um, there was an HTML course in Heidelberg. But it was the time before USB sticks, so we had to carry. So we had to carry our uh, diskettes, like like these these mm -hmm. plastic things around to to keep the HTML on, and which was not that great because images couldn't fit on them. Um, but it still was like. When was it? It was like the the early two thousands when when I worked when I did this the mid two thousands or so. But it was it was quite nice. But then, like for four years, I didn't do much with computers, mm -hmm. and then started like uh, in twenty ten to probably learn Java. And oh, cool! So you never played actually? What I never played what uh, computer games? games. Uh, yeah. I played I uh, I played like for two years. I played games like the the typical sim stuff, but okay. um, then I stopped. I never played again, if I'm honest. Uh, my my game nowadays is fixing segmentation faults in in OpenJDK and other things like Bug Hunting is also a great game. <laughs> Bug Hunting, <laughs> okay, yeah. so. You started in 2010 with uh, Java, you said. Yes. And mm. how it happened? Mm, so it happened, uh, of course, my, my father wanted me to, to, to do something with computer science. So I had like these all NXT, these whole uh, Lego machines lying around. But um, we had to... So, so you used uh, the Lagos? So the, uh, uh, yeah, Java? yeah, yeah. I, I used them later. So the, 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 the problem was, so I used some, some basic blocky programming for the Legos before, but then in 2010, in, I was in 10th grade and we had to do like a project at, at school. And for this project, I programmed, um, an NXT, a Lego NXT prick with Lagos. Um, mm -hmm. to be a garbage collector. So essentially it, it, it like had, uh, an ultrasonic sensor, distance sensor on the top and it mapped out the surroundings and then found some garbage to grab and then drove to the garbage, drove back. And I computed this with, with, I wrote this with Lagos and learned Java for this occasion. And it's funny because like I had a null point exception just for the, before presenting my, my project to my teacher. So it was, yeah, I had interesting experiences with null point exceptions from the beginning. Okay. My arch nemesis. But, but it's a, it, did it work actually with uh, mm. picking the garbage and, and coming back? It, it, it did work good enough that, that I, I got a good trade, but no, it wasn't that great in computer science back then. It was just, I learned like Java three, three months before. So, I wasn't the best. No, but it's still interesting. In, in, interesting idea that you uh, create an autonomous vehicle. 
which gathers, you know, garbage. And, and uh, I think you, you build your first garbage collector with Le- Lejo. So I go, this is incredible. But uh, I, I mean, yes. uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And garbage, co- a real garbage collector is even better. Of course. In Lego. Uh, I think it was the first uh, garbage collector, you know, uh, built in Lego, right, itself. And uh, <laughs> But how you found, you know, the, how to call it, the garbage repository or how to call it the uh, garbage store because you had always to move back to the same area, right? So, um... mm. so, so, so the thing was, I, I, I didn't, so that, that was probably one of the problems in my, in my approach that I uh, just looked into the, um, the just go to um, uh, motor sensors because I can tell the motor like rotate for 10 degrees and then mm-hmm. I just computed the distance. So I wrote the same distance to and from and okay. so it went well enough. As I said, it wasn't the best thing that I developed, and uh, um, <laughs> and you don't find the source anywhere on the internet for good reason. But no, um, that's that's how it started. And I actually like in the same year, I also for bogey practicum. It's like in 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 Baden-Württemberg where I come from. Um, it's like where you go for a week or so in a company as a as a. Uh, as a school child in uh, in grade ten, and work alongside them, and they had to learn Ruby. So um, mm-hmm. Ruby was actually the first. I learned it slightly before learning Java, but it was or at the same time, so around the same time. And Ruby was like the language they liked the most. Um, but yeah, then then they got into Java, and as you see now, it's, Java is still my day job, kind of. <laughs> okay. Since, since uh, all this time, and I even tried to do like a PhD in the field of Java. So, um, but yeah. why why you just you know keep programming? So I mean, was it you had something in mind? So what was your motivation? My motivation was essentially that they became a, that they became a compiler node. So of course, like my background with my father also helps because like computers were all around. But I became a compiler nerd. So uh, if you don't believe me, there's this like go to the Java page. Um, I think it's mm-hmm. the term go to, I think I don't go to the Java page. I think it's the Java page in, in, in Germany, um, on Wikipedia. And also you can also go to like the brain fuck and Ook page mm-hmm. and scroll down the page and you'll see a recording of mine, um, uh, um, um, telling you the story of Java, reading you the, the Java Wikipedia article and also the Ook and Brainfuck article. Because in, in like when I was 16, I started to become a compiler nerd. I bought my first Antler books, um, read them like gospel, got my Eloquent Ruby book, uh, Eloquent Ruby book. And I became a compiler nerd then and that's what kept me going and that's why why i'm here today I'm yeah but like, what 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 do you wanted to achieve with the compa- building oh, compilers i wanted to build compilers i wanted to be a language nerd i designed my own language i wrote interpreters i started thinking about how to write compilers i wrote parsers it's i wrote my first uh uh text editor my where, where I designed like bitmap icons um to have like a proper javascript so a small javascript editor I was just a compiler so you were fascinated by languages? Yes, I'm fascinated by programming languages. Um, mm-hmm. And you still stick with Java, or I mean, because I mean, the Java doesn't make any sense anymore. If you are interested, you know, in programming languages, or you created your own programming languages, or you use Java to implement the compilers, or what was the um, idea? So, so the thing was that that when when oh. I so so I started like small on language projects, and Java was just lying around, so I did few things in Ruby, but Java was just a language staying around and I knew Java already and that's that's cool when you're like in in, in your last years of school that you're sick with it. But um then at university we had to learn Java and then um I started um my and then I found out that we hey we have a compilers um professor at university and then I did my bachelor thesis there on like benchmarking in a compilers team and then my masters and then during my masters I did a compilers lab where we implemented in Java a small version of a small Java compiler so Java to uh, to native compiler um, where I also like developed the register allocation 
and uh, in in Java, which is which is quite nice. And then I just stuck around with my professor and tried to do a PhD for two and a half years, analyzing Java projects because this was analyzing Java for security, so Java programs for security. And yeah, that that was quite quite nice. It was was great time learning, but it didn't in the end work out. So yeah, just stuck in this stuck in this field and then the opportunity came to work on OpenJDK at SAP where I'm currently working. So okay, why it didn't work out your PhD? So what I understood you were just stick with your professor and just, you know, over the years. And then you try to achieve the, why it didn't work out. So you you perform kind of code reviews regarding security and uh, and Java projects. So so what I so what what my master thesis was also about um, was um, writing uh, writing uh, information flow security analysis. So the question is when information comes into your program, how much comes out of your program? Um, how mm-hmm. how much information is like leaked by your program? And I worked on um, doing this for a smaller language based on Java and also for like like a teensy tiny subset of Java um, and worked in this field. Uh, the main problem was just that I didn't get the hang of, of, of the PhD. So that's that's a problem that many PhD students have that like um, you, you are at, after like two years often at a point where they're like, should I really continue? Because... Um, I missed like the mathematical skills, like the deep statistical skills that my field needed. And I was also disillusioned by my field because the field of um, quantitative information flow security analysis was quite stagnant and it still is. So it has problems with unbounded loops and it has problems with recursion. Um, and it was just disillusioned, and then there came um, the the possibility to switch to to SAP to work on open source to be like an open JK developer to do compilers to do profiling, and then I'm like, it's true. But the how, PhD. How, how how the how, how the uh, possibility happened, right? So how how it occurred that you, you that's, got the pos- mm-hmm. That's that's an interesting that's an interesting story because um, so uh, at my team. Um, we we have a few former PhD students. So um, the predecessor of my professor, I, I tried to do a PhD with Professor Snelting, was um, the first computer science professor, I think, in Germany. It's like a Professor Goos, um, who also developed languages and who was there like from from end of the sixties. So quite quite a great professor there. But um, so uh, my um, uh, product owner in the team now um, did a, did his PhD with Professor Ghost. So when they had an open position, um, he wrote to my professor like, "Hey, uh, Frigo, we we have here an open position. Do you have anyone um, that you can recommend?" And he sent the email to us because he didn't want any more PhD students because he's currently like um, going out of university. So he wanted to write down his his um, his. his his institute anyway. Um, and so he wrote to us like, hey, here's to, to us PhD students, hey, here's something you can um, forward to your master students. And I was like, yay, that, that sounds like an interesting opportunity. Was this solution with more PhD? So maybe just call them and they sent them like, hey, um, maybe let's 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 have a chat. And this went well. And uh, then I started shortly after I started uh, last beginning of last year. Um, at this company and never look back if I'm honest. Uh, PhDs are great. I can really recommend trying to do it, but the opportunity that that my team gave me um, are, are endless compared to, to what I was able to do at, as a PhD student. What was your first day at SAP and with OpenJDK? It was quite quite interesting because um, I, I happened to start at, at the first day of the year, not, not like the first, but like the second day, because like first is, is like a public holiday. But so I, I started quite early in the year and most of my colleagues were still in their winter holidays. So I uh, was just there at SAP. I didn't even find my room because I was like, Three months earlier was like the last time there um, for the interview. So um, I, I stumbled uh-huh. through, through the SAP headquarters because SAP is quite a large company. Um, and and I and I phoned my boss like, hey, where are you? And 
how can I come to you, which was quite interesting. But no, um, I then started with the typical IT problems and um, got got an introduction into the OpenJDK project. I before once worked with the OpenJDK project, so I, I did a small research project modifying the Zero interpreter, so I had some knowledge and, of course, have background in, like, compiler, so... It wasn't too unfamiliar, but yeah, I, I then started and I started by helping a colleague that um, was then going into like um, pre-retirement. Um, and he told me like, hey, um, let's, let's, help, let's, let's help me um, work on this Power PC back in Nursing Profile. So the first actual work that I did was helping him to fix a bug in uh, in the power pc support in the power pc support for async profiler and also fixing a bug in the inlining um frames proposal for async profile so um, i think this was like the the second week where we started really working on where we really started working on these stuff and then i think a week later i did my first jk commit fixing a tiny bug on um on uh, compiling um, OpenJDK on uh, Mac M1 because it was the first time I've ever used a Mac M1. I'm before I was like a Linux user, and then my boss said, "Hey, here's 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 your computer. It's a Mac M1." And I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> now I start to use Mac." So it was quite an interesting discovery. But yeah, so uh, since since then week two, I started thinking about implementing a new profiling API and that's what like kept me through these two years now um, working on new profiling APIs working on making profile easy making profiling easier for everyone <clears throat> so you started at SAP two years ago yes wow so uh, and before you you did a PhD and before you started so you are uh... Pretty young. Yes, I'm, I'm slightly younger than most of my colleagues. Yes. No, not younger than me, but almost younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <clears throat> well, uh, interesting. Uh, oh. you, your first, uh, your first programming job at SAP was, I guess, in C. Right? You had to write it in C language. Oh yeah. So so that means my first job. It's even it's it's just my current job. So it's my first actual like, uh, not not my first ever programming job, my, my first full-time programming job. So OpenJK is developed in C++. So um, I work in C++ most of the time. So usually what I do, I do like equal parts, C++, Python, and Java work um, at work, and then some, some Kotlin for the websites. Um, but I did some C++ work at university too. So... Um, had experience with writing more than C++. So um, it wasn't my first time that I ever worked with C++. So this was great. Okay. So your very first programming job uh, was not at SAP. So you did something yes. before? Or was it like a university assignment or you worked for another company? I worked for another company. Not not like in a full-time position, but um, besides my studies. So um, I got the opportunity to work at ICAS when I was... Um, um, during my bet during my master, so I work part time, like one day a week at ICUS, which is like um, a real time JVM uh, creator. Mm. I work there on an options parser, like take a compiler engineer and let him write an option parser, and you can and you get essentially like a com an over engineered option parser, but it's still used today by them. It's, it was it was great um working on these projects. But uh, what is an option it, parser? Oh yeah, it was it's it's like just uh, parsing the options of a program. Um, many people in the Java world nowadays use Pico CLI, but I created my own. Ah, program. okay, That's the cool. argument of, a, of of a main method. Okay, yes. I get it. I thought it was like a you no know, low level program uh, compiler term. So okay, no, <laughs> no. No, it sadly didn't work on compilers there, um, but it was a great opportunity. And um, but um, it didn't work out for me working there after I finished my master. So I started doing a PhD. Um, okay, okay. So uh, and on uh, SAP then with the OpenJDK, and I think the name is SAP Machine, right? Is the name of yes. the OpenJDK. Mm -hmm. Many people call it Zap Machine because um, mm -hmm. there's a word pun in it. Maybe you spot it. Mm -hmm. And we also have like yellow submarine as our logo. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, we 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 quite obnoxious with our word games. Um, so yeah, um, we we at Sub Machine, um, we uh, are the third biggest contributor to the Open JDK. So we help to to improve the Open JDK. Um, for everyone, because like OpenJDK is open source, you can also use Submachine. It's just go to our website submachine.io, and you mm-hmm. can get it. You can even get like Docker images and such. So um, uh, we are the third biggest contributor, as I said, and we also have like um, I think the JDK seventeen maintainer on our board. So mm-hmm. uh, who does a lot of backports? Like backports mean he takes fixes from JDK twenty one and brings them to JK17 and we we work alongside all of the other great companies um, bringing you the open JDK mm-hmm. um, so making you able to use Java. So SAP is using Java a lot, right? Um, I think so, otherwise it would be a waste of, of money to pay us. Now, um, the, the thing is with, with SAP that of course SAP has to create ABAP language um, that is used widely, but also new products um, are built on on Java, of course, like all the web infrastructure out there. There's just like these these uh, the JDK frameworks, the Java frameworks that you know out there, and mm-hmm. also at SAP. And so it makes sense that we have a small team um, helping our customers excel in Java. Actually, I spent a a few weeks of my life in uh, San Leon Road to teach. Oh. ABAP uh, developers Java. So back then, you know, SAP wanted to use Java as the main language. This was the idea, and uh, this was interesting times. So interesting times for me because uh, they didn't like necessarily Java. So I try you now to explain them the thinking, and and at the end, I learned actually the SAP thinking, and I think they appreciated Java a bit more after the after you know the workshops. Yeah, so um, in the beginning, there there was the time um, when when our team started far far before I joined. Um, um, they wanted to replace Abba, but it didn't work out because Abba has also so many advantages over Java. Um, mm-hmm. But don't ask me about the advantages. I'm just like two years in the company, um, so mm-hmm. but um, it it Java was used enough that they started. With uh, with the sub JVM team um, and that morphed now into the submachine team working on open source, open JDK, and essentially what we do we support our internal and external customers. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, you are working now mainly on uh, compilers. It's just an uh, compilers um, profilers. Is yes. it like uh, an accident? Is it your choice or how it happened? It, it was a, it was a practical career choice. So when it was in compilers. Um, and and working there, trying to do my PhD and everything, I I was thinking about what do I want to do like after the PhD, what want to do like in the future, like career wise. And I have a good friend Tobias Carlot, um, who at the time and now again works at JetBrains. He mm-hmm. is part of the um, of the Scala plugin team, and he told me a lot of cool things about. Japanese works and so hey this is a cool team and so I thought like hey maybe I should switch from pure compilers to the field of developer tools like um, this means like profiles debuggers EDE support um, mm-hmm. and then I thought like maybe maybe switch and that and therefore it was like a conscious decision to when I started in the team to go into profiles to focus mostly on profiles. I also did some some few months of work in the debugger space, but I mostly focused on profiles essentially because I found it quite interesting. And what I also found that it was a niche. So um, uh, it's it's a field where not that many people are giving talks about or writing blog posts, but it's an interest to many people. So it's a great niche to, to work at and this year I started doing presentations and I was like at 14 conferences giving giving presentations. Next year I'm already like at um, I'm going to Java Land. You can see me de- there talking about pro uh, talking about debugging, like how debugging works under the hood. You can see the same talk in Canada at uh Confu in, in Montreal mm-hmm. and hopefully at Foster maybe and, and at other conferences and, and other conferences this year was at DevOx Belgium at Java Zone and the like and also at Exactly. Basel so what one. you did you created a 
or you explain how to build your own profiler, right? Yes, it was quite nice. So the the, the idea was that um, um, I thought like, hey, I'm I'm giving talks about profiling, but I'm seeing that people think that profiles are like these magic tools that are developed by the elves somewhere up the hills. Um, so I wanted to show them, hey, you can create a profile in like 24 lines of Java code. And then it published my blog post. And then it went viral on Hacker News, got like to the fourth place for like a day. So that was quite nice. And then I thought like, hey, maybe I can just send in a talk to like conferences like Java Zone and DevOps Belgium. And I was accepted at both of them. And so it was quite nice. I was also like at Basel one with my talks um, mm -hmm. where I sadly... Uh, didn't didn't meet you. I think you were there, but you were probably uh, you were just shortly there for for like a talk, and then you went uh, later to Prague. Um, no, not later, immediately. So I yeah. think it was like you know, uh, this is uh, like uh, the, the 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 travel schedule was crazy. I was like in I don't know five conference in one week. And the, I the funny thing, the the funny <laughs> thing, I wanted to do the same thing. So when I was at when I was at Java, when I was I think it was at, yeah when I was at DevOps. I got the acceptance also for the GeekCon in Prague mm -hmm. just shortly after the, the buzz one. But I was like, I'm not so crazy to like go into my talk at Basel one and then just go to the nearest bus station and drive to Prague to the next day. I was like, I'm not so crazy. And then I saw you doing the same. And I was like, oh no, he's, he's really, he's, he's a person. I couldn't do it, but. This was actually not uh, the the problem. The problem was after Geekon because uh, uh, there was some scheduling, let's say, problems in Poland. There were two conferences in the same week, so I think I was in three days. I was like two thousand kilometers in a train or something like this, but it worked well in a train. But uh, they, 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 I would say Prague and uh, Basel one was easy. This was not like it was not very tight. I, I knew that is possible. The Poland schedule, I was not very sure whether it is possible to do that, but um, it worked out. It was actually a nice memory, so it was cool. What you are showing, you're using async profiler with uh, the flame graphs and you are uh, and uh, flame diagram or graph, and uh, and you explain what happens usually, right? So, what's the intention of so why I should build my own profiler? So, as I said, the main the main problem is. Um, and it's also like a talk you hopefully see it at the, at some conferences next year submitted to you the the the, the problem is that i think many people uh don't understand the tool so many people are like yay uh that's a tool and it's like a magic bullet i can just shoot on it and then my performance problem i i see my performance problem and yay because they don't understand um the concepts of their tools how these tools really work under the hood. And so my idea was with these talks, and I also gave like a complimentary talk on writing a debugger from, mm -hmm. from Sketch. It's called Let's Create a Debugger Together um, in Python. So um, you, uh, it's, 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 it's really good way. It's like the same thing just in Python for debuggers that I did in Java. But the idea is with these talks that I show people, you can build your tool too. You can just build it. Of course, these tools have limitations. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend using these tools in production, but they can give you an understanding on, on how it works. And it also enables you to have a small tool that you can extend easily. So for my tools, for example, for for my tiny profiler, you can easily embed this profile into your own application. You can extend it by additional data. You can extend the flame graph. You can easily modify, just hack on it and make it so you can make it work for your specific application. When a general purpose profile that has advantages won't probably cut it. And so it's it's mainly at, it's mainly an educational uh, purpose, and that's when you look at my blog posts. Um, most what most of my blog posts are. So, for example, I wrote a blog post on instrumenting your code to see which classes are really used. I'm doing this dynamically and just writing like in a few lines of code your own Java agent. And um, I did this with with mm -hmm. other things too. And I feel that it helps people, and I also heard it from different people. It feels that it helps people to understand what's going on. And they you shouldn't be afraid to build your own tools. At university, I even like built my own parser generator that could create GIFs in the end of like the 
part of construction because I wanted to understand how it works. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the thing that I do. Okay, the the tiny tiny profile is it on GitHub somewhere? Of course, it's on GitHub. Um, just search for tiny profiler. Um, uh, um, there's also like a DevOps talk. I gave this talk on this at, at DevOps and multiple other conferences. So, um, just go to GitHub, search for my username. It's part time nerd and and tiny profile, and you'll find it. Um, party party nerd. Party time nerd. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm called. So that's that's a funny story. It was like in in my 2010s. So remember, I'm I'm younger than than. Than other people so in the 2010s it was like in 10th grade and i needed a website and i needed a, a github username because like that's what you want to do as like a, a mm -hmm. 16 70 year old um and i decided on part-time nerd because it was like i'm not fully a nerd i also have like other interests like playing music cooking baking and and riding bicycles and such so it was like yay part-time nerd wasn't taken so so i part-time nerd and then i also got my blog that i then didn't use for like 10 years really uh now only started using now because like i'm publishing once a week every two weeks a blog post on, on java topics um and my blog is called mostynerdless.te um, because uh, when when you when I read the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, the word was described as mostly harmless in the Hitchhiker's Guide, and so I was like, I want to be mm -hmm. mostly nerdless. I don't know. It was just a funny joke that nobody understood, but uh, that's my URL for like the last fifty for like the last fourteen years now, and they kept it ever since. So. Um, that's me on the internet. You can find me at Part Time Nerd almost everywhere, and uh, my blog is at mostlynerdless.de. Okay. So, what your uh, tiny profile? How it is working? So, what is it? So the idea is with the tiny profile that I stripped down um, the how profile worked, and I just got in um, the really essential bit. So, the idea of a profile is essentially that um, you ask. Your application, your JVM regularly, like every 10 milliseconds, hey, what are you currently executing? So give me the stack trace of every thread. And that's essentially what I also do. Like my tiny profiler, what does it do? It has, of course, like some command line parsing, but that's not really important. Uh, that's just generated by ChatGPT, if I'm honest, um, because it's so simple. Um, and my, uh, my profiler, in essence, just calls thread dot get all stack traces every 10 milliseconds because the thread class you can ask like give me the stack traces of all thread yeah i get them and these stack traces are the same that you have in exceptions um and then i store them in a data structure essentially in a tree so i compress the stack traces a bit and then i write um then then i wrote a script that produces from this tree the data structure that um uh, the Flamecraft library for D3 users. So I didn't create like the JavaScript code myself. I just relied on an existing application. So you are basically basically taking every 10 milliseconds the uh, snapshots of the stack traces, storing them in the data structure, uh, and then comparing these, these snapshots, right? Yes, essentially I'm, I'm combining them to, to present a Flamecraft and that's what I then print and it works. Um, it works good enough that people like it, and it's a good thing. Um, I got accepted at conferences. Never thought I would be giving a talk at DevOps Belgium, but mm -hmm. I did on the same topic. Um, it, was, it was quite an honor to be there with all these cool speakers, with many of the people there were like speaking, were like Java champions, and I was just there as like, hey, I started two years ago at, at this, in this field, it's like my first year of, of doing talks, and I gave a talk on this, and which went well, so I'm quite happy. My opinion is that if you have a good idea, you should talk about that. This is always interesting. It doesn't matter your experience, because if you do something and your experience, maybe, you know, there is nothing interesting to say so uh and and in your approach with the tiny uh profiler and how to profit things is interesting um because uh yeah it's unusual to say sad it's a niche project and uh what interests me is with the uh, uh with the data structures 
what kind of data structure is it? Is it simple a hash map or you, do you have something specific? Is this like a... it's more fancier than hash map uh, than hash map? I'm I'm coming from computer science, so I like trees, and so essentially you have a tree because um, what when we especially when we just emit flame graphs, we can like remove the time information, so we don't care when the sample was taken. So what we essentially do when we have a when we have our first um, trace, for example, we have a trace where on the bottom we have like the main method that called the method A that called the method B. So what we're doing, we're creating a tree and mm -hmm. um, we have a node main because that's like the first node and then it has a child A and this has a child B. And so we then record, yay, we, we hit each node once. And then the next time um, we record the trace the same, like the same, like main main called A called B, and so we're incrementing the values at each node. So we now know that we found that we saw the main node twice, that we saw the A node twice, and the B node twice. And then when a trace comes in, that's for example a main called C called D, then the tree branches at the main node. So the main node now has another child called C, which has a child called D. That's how, how we create a quite fast and efficient data structure. And that means that my kind of profiler is actually probably less resource intensive than, than some profilers out there because we compress the data quite good. Of course, we're losing information and that's why normal profiles usually don't do this. But yeah. it's a sign of like, it, 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 it shows you that modifying a profile and writing it yourself, you can focus on different aspects and tailor it to your needs. So in my example, I only wanted to create flame graphs because this is like the main visualization that I give um, users and also what is this uh, that I show users in presentations. And of course, from this data structure, I can also get like the hot method. So how much time did each method execute? How many times? And so that's, that's quite nice. Um, and it works well. And there was someone I gave this talk in in Milan um, this year, like in May. And there was someone who who told me like, "Hey, um, I want to use this in uh, in a, in a client's web application because the client prohibits us to run external profilers on it. And I can just like take your profiler, compile it into my application, and run it there and have some profiling information." I was like, "Yay!" <laughs> But that's the problem is when you're doing open source, so it's MIT licensed. Um, so everyone can just grab it, modify it. I have someone who, who wanted to use it in a JDK 11 context. So mm -hmm. I think he, he transpiled it, he, he modified it so that it works on JDK 11 too. Um, I mentioned it in my in the README of Titan profile. So, so it got its own life. And that's what I like with open source projects. They evolve, people use it. People have comments and it helped me also. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I got in touch with many people and it gave me opportunities that I wouldn't otherwise have hadn't I done um, a tiny project that, that went bigger than I expected. The, uh, the, uh, the tree, is this uh, built by you or using a dedicated data structure? Uh, it's just a tree. So it's just a tree built by me building a tree. So thing of like 10 lines of java code and what are the nodes of the trees are this uh, java records or or which and, uh, i didn't know whether i use java records i would have to take a look but i think i just created a class because yeah okay the, which which attributes the java class has uh, um component the java, java class has of course like uh the children we mm -hmm. need to know the children nodes and uh because to, to make it easier, the, the children nodes is a map. So a um, map of like function name that the child represents, like function plus class name that the child represents, and um, then mapping to the node. Um, and then it also knows how many times the node was hit. So how many times it occurred. And that's all. And of course, its own name. Yeah, it knows its own name. It knows that it belongs to method B. Um, and that's all. And it, it works and we can then just um, transform it to JSON and pass it to the D3 Flamecraft library, which is quite neat. So I didn't have to program my own Flamecraft. Um, but essentially what a Flamecraft library does, it 
um, uses this tree and looks like at the main method and for the main node, it knows like, hey, um, this has been hit twice or three times now, example, three times. So we have a bar that did three units worth the wide and then it has two children. So it places two bars on top of the main bar and this bar for the method A, if the child A was like hit twice, then two, then the bar for, for A is like two uh, units wide and for C, if we have another child C for the main node, this is like one bar wide and that's essentially how it creates from this tree a flank graph and that's quite easy um, to use and also to understand. And I give this in my presentations to show people how flank graphs works. To come from flame graphs to individual traces back to flame graphs uh, because this is um, what I found works best for people to comprehend what really is is the source of information for a flame graph. Yeah, so the uh, a tree is uh, a natural, so a flame graph is a natural representation of a tree, right? Yes. Because if you uh, what, because if we imagine, let's say the root would be main. And the child nodes would be this like the broadest representation. So you can then the yeah exactly the main is this actually even the same direction right. So it, it, if you if you if you think about a tree and a flame graph, you can directly m map it one to one, right? Yes, and that's and that's very great. Of course, like only a tree that has um, that has a name attribute and a width attribute, so hit attribute, but that that works and that's and that's the beauty of trees and flame graphs and after i understood that flame graphs are essentially representation of trees um i could then show it to people and people were like oh yes so so you can you could represent a windows file system as a flame graph right of course and this is the next project not, tiny file no, system no 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 if i'm honest <laughs> like uh, it's a long time since i used uh, since i used windows um but you can definitely do it, and there probably are people doing or, it. Or Unix file system, it doesn't matter. I just said Ooh. Windows for fun. It, it's an interesting idea, but if I'm honest, I'm more compilers guy, so if too many projects that I want to work on, um, and there are too many interesting new cool stuff and also work that they have to do. So no, not, not another hobby project, not mm -hmm. another project. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well, you also said something interesting with the profiler. What you said is that you don't have time information. So you are basically only counting, right? So what yes. happens is you are, you are, you are taking the uh, stack traces. So if I parse the stack trace in order to know to which node it, uh, it basically relates. And then you have atomic long, I guess, or int, and you are just increasing the, uh, the counters per node. And the flame graph only represents the frequency or how often something was executed. But mm -hmm. you have no time information in your profile, yes. right? Yes, but that's usually not a problem. That, that's no, no, it's not, not a problem. problem. But this is a it is interesting because if I think about profiler, I think about time measuring, and we have actually to find the definition of a profiler. Whether a profiler is about time measurement, or because maybe you have to rename your project to a tiny counter. Yeah? No, it's it's it, it's not it's it's not a problem because most most commonly used profilers do approximation. So there are two types of profiles that profiles that do like really count or, or look how long each method was actually executed but that's quite cumbersome because it takes a large performance hit. because with java we have so many methods being executed all the time we would essentially just be running um the profiling code and then some some tiny application code in between so what we actually normally do we do sampling profiling so that's the thing that like async profile is based on and thereby also all your other profiles because your your application performance monitors from Elasticsearch to um, to the one from Grafana, Datadog, whatever they use sampling profiling usually because it's it's far cheaper and we can just ask the JVM and then what we actually get we don't get like the timing information we don't get the measure of how much how how long a method run but we get an approximation of it because when we see we are sampling at the 10 millisecond interval and we hit the method like five times, then we can guess that this method probably run in the ballpark of of, five, of 50 milliseconds. Of course, it's just an 
approximation. If this method just always ran when we were sampling, then the method could have like actually run just like a few milliseconds and we hit it five times and we now think, oh, it it probably run like for for that much time. But um that's not a problem because um we only should really use profiling when we have enough data. So when we hit a method just like five times now, nah, it could be spurious, but usually when we hit like a method a thousand times or so, then we can say, okay, it's probably in the ballpark of like a thousand times the interval because mm-hmm. it would be a pretty large coincidence if this method would be only available at the same time. Of course, we should do a bit more randomization in like when we take like the measurements, but the good thing is we have uh, garbage collection, we have other things in the JVM that are producing noise, and we of course also have like your underlying operating system. So that's not a problem. Usually it's good enough uh, take, mm-hmm. uh, taking just the, the amount of hits. So what it means is uh, if the you know snapshot interval is 10 milliseconds and you see that the count increased by 5, so you are assuming <coughs> the average ex- <coughs> execution time are 2 milliseconds. Um, yes. If the interval is like 10 milliseconds, then we assume that when we hit it five times, that the method run for five times the interval because we expected it if running like the whole interval section. That's an over approximation, but it works fine. People use it. And so it has more advantages than disadvantages. But yes, yeah, so the notion of time in profilers is interesting. <laughs> You should take care and so don't trust your profiles too much. Um, even did like a talk and you can find it online called Do Your Trust Profiles and Once Did Too. So that's that's where I go into problems that profiles have. Um, what I said is is actually technically impossible. So if you run the uh, the interval every 10 milliseconds, mm-hmm. we cannot increase the counter by five. So you can only have an increase of one. Right, mm-hmm. so this is what um, so what it means is if we run the int- see an inter uh, in- increase in five intervals and it increased by five, then it says uh, then we say an average would be ten milliseconds, right, of the method just to understanding because uh, the entire interval was then fifty milliseconds increased by five, it would be ten millisecond execution time of a method, just to get just to understand what what they are doing actually and are, are you also measuring the performance or just um you mean am, am i also helping people do profiling or am i just no whether the tiny profiler also uh is uh, approximating you know the me- method performance or it's just you know counting the the uh the execution frequency it, it just it just approximates the execution frequency because from the execution frequency we can prox it's it's a proxy for the method performance mm-hmm and how much overhead that does it have? I, I mean, it should be b- below one percent or something. Overhead like this, right? is just it depends on the application. But if you don't have too many, it's of course always the question um, of what, right? So overhead, if you have just if you don't yeah. have like uh, hundreds of threads, but if you have a, like just a few application threads, I found that with an interval of like ten to twenty milliseconds, you have an overhead of like two or three percent. So mm-hmm. that's that's good enough. Um, mm-hmm. It's comparable to other existing profile so it's not as terrible but the problem is um, i'm taking the stack traces of all threads because it's impossible in java to just tell java like hey give me all the currently running threads all the Mm -hmm. threads that you have so essentially i'm getting the stack traces for all threads and so if the number of threads increases um then the time of course increases that my profile needs but uh, normal profiles like async profile jfr they just sample uh, the thread. So they not only like sample every 10 milliseconds, but every 10 milliseconds, they only take a subset of all threads. Mm-hmm. So that also means that when you have, for example, JFR, like the JK flight recorder, and have an application with a thousand threads and an interval of 10 milliseconds, then at every interval, only like one, only like eight so 10 threads are selected. I don't remember whether it's 8 or 10. Um, mm-hmm. Depends on, on the profiler. But so it even samples across the threads because um, we don't want the profile to hog too, ma- too, too many resources because especially when we're monitoring a live system, um, the system shouldn't go down because we attach the profile. What will you do when Loom 
becomes more popular with your tiny profiler. This would be interesting challenge, right? Um, it will be an interesting challenge. It will be an interesting challenge for the profiling world uh, as such. So the tiny profiler doesn't care about loom. Um, it probably would sample all loom threads because loom threads should be visible through the through the thread. Get all stack traces, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, of course, when you have many threads. And that's a problem because the, I don't sample across the threads. I just take the stack trace of all threads. But I think it's it's not a problem yet in Tiny Profile because it's just an educational tool. Don't use it in production. Just take. No, it'd be interesting to know what happens. No, if you have millions of threads, whether we still manage to do something or just will break. No. It it will probably try to do something, but it will probably hop the performance. So. Um, yeah. Sure. Well. Still cool. Right? I don't know. I, I haven't checked it out, but it's an interesting idea. Maybe maybe uh if someone out there who's listening is interesting, just just test it yourself and then if it fails, write an issue and it's an open source project. Um I'm So what, what's your, your pet project or leisure project right now? There are a few of them. Um so the the thing is with my work is that the cool thing that many of my pet projects are also like work related projects, so um, there are a few of them. So my work project currently is working on my profiling API, getting a new profiling API in JDK. Because the problem with Loom is that with Loom profiles like async profiler, and that trade in in sampling. So I want to add a new profiling API that that helps profilers to uh, work with Loom and especially ZGC because there are some. The combination of both is it's not the best kind of for profiles, so we'll work on this uh, for work. Then I worked a bit on Panama. Um, you probably know it's like the 4 in function interface that's preview mm-hmm. in 21, that's coming in 22. So I just, like a few weeks back, I think about last week or so, I wrote a blog post on using Project Panama. Um, you can find it out there. It was well received and... Because I have a small pet project that I'm working on currently. Um, essentially, the idea is uh, with Project Panama, we have the ability to write. Um, Johannes, to write... I have a better idea. I should reinvite you back to talk about Panama and the profile API. Oh yes, you, you can you can invite me because there's there's a current upcoming project. I won't talk too much about it. It's Babylon related. No, no. I, I the, the thing is, I'm currently working on. Um, and when when is when is this blog post going out? When is this recording uh, going out? I have no idea. In in two or three weeks. So oh, keep God, it secret. God, we do we do it next time. No, then then I can talk about it. So um. Essentially, went to to the folks who are, we were recording this like in in mid December. So, um, when you when this session is out, um, there will be my um, blog post out on using EPPF because I found EPPF quite interesting. It's a cool thing. You can essentially write programs in your kernel, hook to mm-hmm. certain hooks like system calls. Like every time um, someone on the system does some uh, network interaction. Um, you can hook a small program on it, but there's currently no Java API in the user land to facilitate this. There's just an API. There are just APIs in Go, in, in Rust, mm-hmm. and Python. So it was like, maybe let's write one. So um, on the time this, this session goes out, there there's already my new blog post hopefully out on using, uh, on, on writing um, a Java API for eBPF. So you can write EPPF programs using Java, using Panama, and have fun with it. And just go to my blog and and take a look. And there there will be cool new stuff coming up in the next few weeks. And there's the winter holidays, so um, I'll, I'll like to hack on things like very good because EPPF is a hot stuff, right? So you can actually have a low level kernel almost routing, driver level yes routing. So. so. It's, so my idea was so my idea was I wanted to learn EPPF and how how do I learn something? I write an open source project on it. So um I started to work with 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 another person. Um he's called uh Mohamed Abolate. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he currently works at Spotify and we're working on and he helps me working on this and it's essentially an Java API for writing EBPF. 
So you can easily just without any hopefully skills in C, C++ development or Python development, you can write your own eBPF programs. Um, this is an ongoing project. It's a tiny pet project. Um, it helps me learn Panama. It gives new example programs for Panama. So it also helps like, my team because uh, one colleague in, in my team is, has implemented Panama on PowerPC. So we're always looking to, to get more knowledge in there. And yeah, uh, just take a look and uh, hopefully uh, I can give a presentation on like... A few on tiny things. eBPF, right? So write your eBPF in 20 lines. So this is what no, uh, I'm no, looking not, for already. <laughs> no, well, not, maybe not, 30. Not this maybe 30. We gave Java 21, so the code is a little bit more compact. <laughs> So, uh, so thirty lines could uh, could could work. No, no. The idea is essentially to have a to have a Java. So to to be able to write in Java code, write um, write your eBPF front end code. So you, you can have a Java API with which you can register eBPF programs in your kernel and um, interact with with these eBPF programs, which is quite nice because then you can do things like. Um, network routing and such um, with mm -hmm. the help of Java um, and don't have to call from Java, Python, or Go program as people currently do it. Um, and I hope to make essentially eBPF more accessible because I want to learn eBPF and the best way is to like teach other people along the way. So there will be my blog series on called Hello eBPF. Hello eBPF from the Java world. We are also there. We want, Perfect. We want to join the party. So where people can find you? So a part-time nerd and mostly nerdless yes. is the blog, right? Yes, mostly nerdless is the blog or bechberger.me, like my last name, .me, also works. Um, and you can find me on Twitter. It's there. I'm at part-time nerd with like the last, the last E is of me because part-time nerd was already taken. <laughs> But just search for my name. Uh, Johannes Bechberger is quite a unique name, so you should find me. Um, you find my team at submachine.io. Um, we're doing lots of great work, um, having fun with it. So we're highly motivated to make Java the best Java ever. So the next word. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, I'll block. So you have should prepare. So then the next time, my first question is going to be why Submachine is better. Oh. This is your this is your homework. So you no, know, yes. this was what you are saying right now. So um, uh, I would like to hear it next next time. So the, you know the the the, the ne next ten minutes are yours. Yes. Next time. So thank you. It was a pleasure yeah. to meet you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, meeting you also. I hope we meet uh, somewhere again on the house. Or I hope I meet some of the listeners at Frostem or in Canada. I don't know how far Airhex reach is. Um, see you there. Perfect.